Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation. And thanks especially to the organizers for putting this all together. Um, today, I'll be talking about re-identifying mobile devices using real-time bidding advertising networks. Uh, I'm Keen Sung, and my colleagues are Johnny Huang and professors Mark Corner and Brian Levine. And this was work done at UMass Amherst. First, I'll talk a bit about real-time bidding. Now, real-time bidding is uh, something that you can see all over the place. Um, most standard ads that you see at the bottom of uh, many free apps and games on the phones um, are probably real-time bidding ads. Um, and the unique thing about these ads are you can target very specific parameters about the device as an advertiser, um, or you can even target individual devices if you have the advertising identifier. And that's something I'll be talking about uh, a little bit later on. You can also collect data from these devices, for example, um, things like IP address, but also device model, um, uh, GPS if it's available, uh, stuff like that can be sent back to the advertiser. And um, it doesn't cost that much to become an advertiser. All you need is uh, about $100 and you know a fake online store. And uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, $23.48 billion were spent um, on uh, RTB ads in the United States alone in 2018. So in comparison to traditional advertising, where an advertiser sends an ad to a TV and then expects uh, other people to watch it, we have mobile RTB advertising, where you have this flow of information that goes both ways. And what we're really focused on is this process called the impression. This is the actual showing of the ad. And you'll see here when uh, my phone decides to wake up uh, that what we're doing is we're opening an app and then every 30 seconds um, on the bottom there will be a refreshing of the ad. And during that refreshing you'll see that um, uh, behind the scenes there's going to be uh, this bidding process that happens and then this loading of the ad. So right now it's blank at the bottom, but after a few seconds you'll see the ad trying to load. Um, so at this point, the bidding has finished and the ad's loading, and, and now the ad's loading, loaded. Okay, so I'll, I'll go over that process in a second. What do you need, or what's happening here? First, we have an advertiser um, that registers with the demand side platform. That's one of the players in this network. Um, the demand side platform bids on behalf of the advertiser um, in the ad exchange, and it bids with the supply side platform, which represents the app or the publisher. And those are the ones making money from the ads. So going through this process step by step, first we have the blank um, on the bottom, nothing is going on, there's an ad space. So the app sends an ad request to the supply side um, provider. Then bid requests are sent to every all the demand side uh, providers in the network, platforms, pardon me, um, one of which works with our advertiser. And at this point, um, we've already seen some data being sent from the ad. Uh, we have things like geo-coordinates, IP address, app ID, um, sorry, ad ID, and app ID, actually, and uh, device information, such as the model of the phone. Um, that all gets sent through the advertising network. It doesn't reach the advertiser yet, because they haven't yet won um, any, any of the bids. So the bids get sent back, and then the winning bid gets sent to the device. Now the device knows uh, who the advertiser is and um, what they'll do is they'll request an ad directly from the advertiser. Um, and this begins the two-way flow of information. Um, and in this flow of information, um, it's not going through an exchange or anything. It's a direct connection. Um, so the ad gets sent to the phone and then uh, uh, could be a piece of JavaScript that actually runs some kind of script where uh, an image gets sent back or video or something interactive from the advertiser server. And so you'll notice here there's actually two more opportunities to send data. The first, um, getting the ad actually reveals the IP address and things like cookies and e-tags, things you would expect from a browser ad. And um, after the JavaScript gets called, the JavaScript itself could call information as well. Uh, for example, it could reveal what's in, stored in the web storage of the ad within the app, and that's something that we'll focus on in this talk. Um, other things such as GPS and other sensors are also allowed sometimes 
Um, it depends on many factors such as whether the user has enabled location sharing in the app. So um, what is this data used for? Well, uh, one very useful thing um, from that is used by the DSP is for filtering out ads that are irrelevant. For example, um, if it sees a bid for locations that are not of interest to the advertiser, it won't bid on, uh, sorry, bid requests. It won't bid on those requests um, because that's just a waste of money. Um, but the more, uh, I guess, insidious thing that's possible is advertisers can start to collect longitudinal information about a specific user uh, through the ad ID. Um, the ad ID is a semi-persistent uh, ID that's uh, attached to the phone. It's persistent between apps. And um, just to give a brief overview of how it works, well, first, you know, in, but before 2014, uh, they were using hardware identifiers to, to do this. And then ad IDs were actually put in place to improve privacy. So um, IDs were still persisting between apps, but users could reset them whenever they wanted. Um, if you think about uh, some of you in the, uh, watching this have probably turned this off, some of you probably haven't, in which case you probably want to. Um, in 2019, because this was still uh, somewhat of a privacy concern, uh, Mozilla petitioned Apple to start rotating IDs once a month. Um, and actually, just very recently announced earlier this month, um, ad IDs will be required uh, to be an opt-in permission on iOS apps um, early next year. So our threat model is very simple. We have users that don't want to be tracked, and they've turned off their ad tracking feature. And on the other hand, advertisers want to continue tracking users. It's profitable, or um, just uh, probably for more nefarious reasons, to just want to track a user using their ad ID. Of course, with ad ID, it's pretty easy. You just uh, acquire the ad ID of the user. Um, if you are only interested in uh, the user's behaviors and like you want to track them over time, you don't really care who they are, um, you just acquire uh, the person of interest and you retarget it. Um, if you are interested in who the person is, you want to tie it to an identity. That's not in the scope of this presentation, but there are strategies you can do that. You can, If you figure out the IP address of the user, you can try to use that to tie that to the ad ID. Um, there are third-party services, uh, data vendors online that carry these databases, and you could go use those as well. Now, um, how about without ad ID? Well, uh, we're going to talk about using web view storage, um, which is basically the ad storage. Uh, storage is available to the ad um, view within an app uh, as a way of marking devices. So what an advertiser could do is find a device, mark it with a unique identifier, then retarget it using some of the available filters, such as IP, GPS, um, et cetera. Um, and then they can verify whether uh, these devices that they see uh, match the mark uh, or have been marked before or not. Um, and they can try to find the device of interest that way. So um, we evaluated this marking and retargeting method uh, by looking by actually targeting ad IDs of many thousand devices, um, well, a, a few thousand devices, and then measuring the recall. So basically, re uh, we considered it recalled if we found the device to contain marks over time, and also if they um, contained uh, retargeting parameters, the IP and GPS uh, remained fairly uh, consistent with our retargeting filter. Um, and we did this by deploying several uh, longitudinal advertising campaigns. Um, we have one looking at mark persistence where we targeted um, our list of devices once every few weeks and did this over three months. And then we also had uh, longitudinal tracking where we um, uh, targeted a separate population of devices once every two hours for a month. And then we actually ran a case study where instead of targeting ad IDs and doing this post hoc analysis, we actually um, retarget, uh, targeted only the uh, retarget filters and uh, saw if they could, got the mark back and measured uh, recall that way. So I'll talk a little about the case study at the end. 
So first, uh, tracking without add ID, we look at a few factors. One is storage. Um, how long are these marks being stored for? If Are they even stored long enough to see it the next time? Uh, second is consistency. Basically, if users are not staying in the same place or not using the same IP, um, it's going to be hard to retarget them. And then finally, cost, which is pretty important because um, on the surface, impressions are pretty cheap. They're 20 cents to 10 dollars in general per thousand. Um, but if you're targeting millions of devices, uh, costs can spiral out of control. So our design is uh, pretty simple. We just deployed ads. We advertised our computer science program at UMass. Um, and we deployed ads for these in several different towns and cities throughout the United States. Um, and here's an example. This is our ad tag at the very top. You can see a link to our website um, and some highlighted uh, features of this ad tag. You can see the device identifier is there, um, which is filled in by the DSP. You can see uh, GPS here. Um, if it's available, the DSP fills that in. And then finally, we load something called mark.js, which is our script for storing our proprietary identifier in the, uh, in the in the phone's app storage. Uh, so here's how that works. Uh, JavaScript is sent to the phone, then it runs that script. Uh, and what that script does is it gets the ad ID, or sorry, it um, runs get, get ID. This is not the ID, this is our proprietary ID. Um, and if it's not available, then it randomly generates one and stores one to the storage, um, and then sends the other to, or sends, and also sends it to the um, advertiser. Now, if we find that phone again, it does the same thing. It tries to get the ID, and then it goes into the device storage. And if it's there, then it uh, sends the identifier back to the advertiser. And that's how we know that we got the same device back. Um, so using this method in our mark persistence data set, we found that um, at least a few of these marks are stored for months. Um, the x-axis here is a time scale of 90 days, uh, well, 84 days, which is almost three months. Um, and so uh, we found that the index DB uh, storage call works uh, is most persistent on Android, and the local storage uh, call is most persistent on iOS. Um, and both of these are JavaScript calls. Um, they're very easy to implement as a developer. And uh, these marks, as I just mentioned, last for months. Um, there are other methods, such as the caching methods on the left. They, um, cache gets evicted very quickly, so they drop uh, pretty quickly. They're not that persistent. But um, this could work if we can retarget them uh, fairly precisely. So the next thing we looked at is IP consistency. Um, so how long does a user keep their IP address? And if we target an IP address, are we going to get those devices back? Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, our non-cellular IPs, which are, uh, for example, home Wi-Fi networks, those ones don't uh, reset all that often. The x-axis here is on the time scale of about a month. Um, on the other hand, cellular IPs are uh, not that persistent. You get a new one each, uh, probably each session you use your phone. Um, so they actually offer more privacy from advertisers if, if you're connected to um, your, cellular, uh, your cellular connection when you use an app. Um, next, we also looked at GPS consistency. Now, uh, this takes a little bit of explaining. So um, there, when the geo coordinates are filled in by the DSP, they come from either uh, the GPS or from um, IP geolocation. So uh, of course, GPS is more useful because it's more um, accurate or more precise. Uh, what we can see, uh, the graph on the right shows is um, uh, coordinates from precise GPS, and we see that 75% of users don't really, uh, or not 75%, 75% of impressions for each uh, user shows up within one kilometer of uh, their original impression. So they don't really move around all that much when they're using their phone um, over the uh, month on the x-axis here. Um, on the other hand, um, to get the same kind of recall uh, we want to target 10, a 10 kilometer radius uh, for users who don't have GPS turned on. So uh, using ge geolocation, 
with GPS uh, substantially reduces advertising cost, which is why, as you see on the left here, we have apps that are asking for location uh, permissions despite not needing it. This is a torrent app. There's no reason they need location, but um, it's you know better for advertisers. So finally, uh, we look at cost. So um, just the, the banner result here is it costs about $5 a day to track each device, um, which is substantially, this, it is more expensive than using uh, ad ID, but it's not prohibitively expensive if you're only trying to track a couple devices. Um, in general, Android is slightly cheaper to target. And um, of course, geolocation, as you can see on the bottom here, substantially reduces cost for the same amount of recall as you would want. Um, uh, and if you look at the top here, um, you can see that you know targeting IP is uh, pretty helpful, but uh, geolocation helps more uh, if you have GPS. Uh, finally, finally, we looked at um, the case studies, which are our experiments where we tried to find uh, devices without using ad ID at all. Um, and so on the left, we have the general result, which is um, we looked at um, trying to get some, well, first we sampled 1700 ad IDs over a day, and then we tried to get them back within 48 hours without using ad ID tracking, just using our methods and verifying that um, our marks were stored. And for less than $90, we got back 38% of these devices. And on the right, we uh, did the same experiment, but we targeted only v uh, devices that were connected to VPN connection. These are users who ostensibly want more privacy. Um, and we still uh, got back 10% of these devices for uh, $20. Um, and keep in mind, these are users who want privacy, but they have ad ID still turned on. And, also, and among these users, we looked at for a while, uh, one third of these, these devices were eventually seen on non-VPN IPs and um, one third were uh, eventually shared precise geo coordinates. So um, in conclusion, it's costly, but not too costly to track a device without an ad ID. Um, and so uh, just general advice uh, for privacy seekers, um, you'd want to disable location sharing and you probably want to use a non-static IP, so like a cellular connection, if you're using an app that has ads. Um, and if you want to prevent these, this kind of marking, right now it's very hard. What you have to do is reset your phone's um, or, or your app's uh, app data storage. Um, so on Google, you would do that through an app manager. Um, on iOS, you would need to uninstall and reinstall the app. And um, like I said, this is kind of a cumbersome process, which is why we want uh, OS developers to consider adding um, methods for users to um, reset this web storage more easily or add restrictions to web views. So request permissions from users uh, to use a, a web view storage um, or add web view storage or something um, before letting ads actually do that. Um, so thanks again for sitting through this talk and I'll be around for any questions.